Today's lecture is on Fourier transforms, and Fourier transforms are, are when we don't have periodicity in our uh, initial function. And so just, just as a reminder, um, just from the last lecture that we did, we were dealing with periodic functions. And for instance, one of the things that we looked at was this classic function, which is the uh, square pulse. Okay, it's a wave of square pulses. And so these obviously have a periodicity, and so these things, you can go from center to center, so we'll call that uh, lambda. And now the uh, solution to this is a Fourier series, and I'll just write down what the answer was. And so you know, f of x was equal to uh, 2 over a. That's just actually the average of the function. And then there is an infinite series, and it's an infinite series that have integer indexes, and we're looking at coefficients 4 over a, and then we get this sinc function, which we're going to be seeing a lot of. Now it has an integer argument. It does have this k value. Now that k is 2 pi over the repeat. I'll write that in just a second. Here's the repeat over a, and then this was a cosine of mkx, and in all of this, k is taken as the fundamental, which is 2 pi over the repeat. Now, you recognize that, that the function of these integers is to, is to bring in harmon <clears throat> harmonics, right? So there's a, there's a fundamental at 2 pi over lambda, uh, but then there's a harmonic at 2 pi over lambda over 2, and then another harmonic at, at 2 pi over, over lambda over 3, etc. And so there's an infinite series of harmonics, and that's why we actually get uh, this integral, or not this integral, actually why we get the summation. And so what we're doing here is we're actually summing over um, all the harmonics that go into creating the square wave, right? So each harmonic is just a perfect sinusoid. You add those all together with the right coefficients, uh, and you can get this thing that looks like a square wave. <clears throat> okay, so that's when it has a repeat period, and so that's for periodic functions. And so uh, just to summarize that, periodic function That means that we have a Fourier series. Okay, but now we want to consider the case of a non-periodic function. And this brings us over to what's called a Fourier a transform or a Fourier integral. Okay. So let's take a look at a, a non-periodic function. And so that's going to be just some function which never repeats. And so we'll just look at just some kind of a random function here. And so it's, you know, I'm not trying to make it periodic. And so it just kind of goes on forever. One way of kind of viewing this, it's it's as if it had a repeat period. In fact, let me let me just kind of put it put a dash line there. You know, what, what would happen if at that point I then go ahead and start repeating the function again? And so then this is this, you know, this duration t. But then what, what happens if I actually let t go off to infinity, right? So that, that's really what we're kind of considering here. Um, so when we say it's non-periodic, uh, you could also say that it's, it's periodic on an interv in, on, on a, uh, infinite interval. Um, and so you won't be surprised that a lot of the uh, results of Fourier transforms look similar to what we got when we did Fourier series. And so I'm just going to write down the, um, the equations. Uh, at this stage, we're not deriving the Fourier transform. We're, we're going to be using them in diffraction problems. And so at this stage, I'm just going to write down what's, uh, what the answer is. Right? And so any function f of x, and it doesn't even have to be a continuous function. It has to be single valued, uh, but it can have discontinuities even, is given by one over pi. I mean, obviously the square wave had discontinuities, and so the square wave is something that we can actually um, approximate, or approximate, we can approximate it um, with arbitrary accuracy by going to uh, high enough sums in, in our sum, summation. <clears throat> 
All right, so we're going to take f of x equals 1 over pi. It's now going to be an integral from 0 to infinity of a of k cosine. Now, there's no integer here. This is just a continuous valued function. And we're actually integrating over dk and then plus another integral goes from 0 to infinity b of k and this is sine of kx so there's no mkx here right so the infinite series is gone there's no infinite sign here uh, these are just integrals and again integrate over uh, dk and so that's the expression for the function f of x and then these coefficients and these integral equations are given by the integral from minus infinity to infinity of f of x cosine kx. Now this case is we're integrating over x and then b of k is equal to the integral from minus infinity to infinity of f of x and then that's sine of kx dx. Okay. All of this all of this goes into a uh, double box. Uh, we didn't derive it, but we're going to be using this for the rest of the semester. All right, and so these are the Fourier transform relationships. Okay, um, what this means is that uh, I've got a continuous function. Well, actually, well, it's a continuous valued function. It's, it doesn't have to be continuous. It can have discontinuities. Uh, but I have a con continuous um, valued function f of x. And that's in real space or direct space. And I have these new functions. Now, when we had four A series, we had coefficients. Now we actually have functions. Uh, these are functions in K space, right? So there, there is a, so X is the direct space, and then K is the reciprocal space or uh, K space. And so I've got A of K and B of K. A of K, you see, is a uh, inner product of the function on cosines, and so that's called a cosine Fourier transform. And then b of k is an inner product defined as an integral on sine of kx. And so then this is actually called the sine Fourier integral or Fourier transform, okay? And so a of k and b of k are the Fourier transform of f of x, and f of x is the Fourier transform of a and b of k. And so the way this is expressed is we say f of x equals Fourier transform of some, I'm going to do a capital F of k, and then f of k is the inverse Fourier transform, although inverse Fourier transforms have virtually the same properties as Fourier transforms. Um, there are minor differences uh, that only come in if your functions are complex valued. Right? So if you, if you have real valued functions, there's actually uh, no issue between Fourier transforms and their inverse. Um, and so they're almost the same thing. And so you often can get away with just doing two Fourier transforms in a row and you just get back to the, your starting point. So this is the inverse Fourier transform of, of f of x, right? little f of x. Okay, and so um, what I can do is is um, then just basically create an equation that um, that just makes that really clear that f of x oops wow did I just lose everything oh there it is okay so so f of x and little f of x and big f of k are related through a Fourier transform, okay? And so they are always viewed as pairs. And so we always end up talking about Fourier transform pairs. And so there's going to be some direct function and then there's going to be its Fourier transform or the Fourier transform could be the direct function and um, and the Fourier transform of that just gets us back to, uh, well, to the, uh, you know, it's anyway, so you're just going back and forth between x to k, k to x. Um, you actually, 
don't, um, it's not that you don't care, but, um, but basically you can work as easily in K space as you can in X space. Um, and a lot of physical processes are, are best understood in, in K space, also known as Fourier space. And so, so working in Fourier space, solving problems in Fourier space, uh, you know, setting up problems in K space, solving them. Um, and then if you need to know what the, what the real space function is that's associated with that, then you would just take a Fourier transform at the end. And so you could work a whole problem in K space. And then the last step is you'd take a Fourier transform to bring you back over to direct space. Um, and that is actually quite common uh, in physics as you get into high energy physics or solid state physics or atomic and molecular optics and things like that. And so Fourier transforms are just absolutely fundamental. They show up all the time in virtually all the rest of the courses that you're going to take in physics. And if you haven't had a course in Fourier analysis, um, that's actually okay. They're, they're pretty easy to work with. I mean, you can see the integral uh, equations. You're really just integrating functions over cosines and sines. And, um, and you, you'll, you can just go to integral tables uh, or, uh, you know, or handbooks to look up uh, answers and things like that. Okay, but I am going to talk a little bit more, but there are special functions um, that we work with quite a bit in, in physics, like the Gaussian is actually going to be one of them. So Gaussian functions are very special. So let's take a look at an application of the Fourier transform. And so what I'm going to do is look at a, um, a single square pulse. So it's not a pulse train anymore. It's just a single square pulse. Okay, and so it's going to be zero. It's going to come up to one, go back down to zero. Okay, as a function of position. And so this is an x space, and this is going to go from minus l over two uh, to plus l over two. And and so this is f of x. And so now we want to find what its Fourier transform is. So one of the first things you do is you look at symmetry. And so the way I've set up my coordinate axes, I put my zero right in the middle of this pulse. And so what that means is that this is a symmetric function. All right. So a symmetric function, if it's, if it's integrated over a cosine, which is also a symmetric function, I'm going to get something finite. But if I were to integrate this over sine, I get zero. Sine's an odd function, and, and this square pulse uh, is, an, is an even function. And so if you integrate an odd over an even function um, over uh, you know, the full range of x, uh, you get zero actually. And so it's one thing that tells you is that you know, sines are orthogonal to cosines, but sines are also orthogonal to any even function. So therefore, we know immediately that v of k is zero. And I don't even need to do that integral because I already know that even and odd functions will integrate to zero. Okay. So all we have to do is look for the, uh, the cosine transform. So the sine transform is zero, so we'll do the cosine transform. So this is the integral from minus infinity to infinity. It's over f of x, and then I've got cosine of kx, and then I'm integrating this over x. Because of the finite range of the, or finite domain of the, uh, the function, this, this immediately comes over to being an integral uh, from minus L over two to L over two. And then the function was just equal to one. And so then I literally just get a cosine of kx dx. And so right off the bat, um, having this finite function, I don't integrate off to infinity. I'm just integrating between minus L over two and plus L over two. And I'm just integrating a cosine and the integral of a a cosine is actually a sine, right? And so I can just write the solution down immediately. Now I do have actually, I mean, not to go too fast, um, I do have this k in here, right? And so I do have to, you know, include that in my integral. And so when I do that, I get a one over k, and then I have a sine of kx, and it's evaluated between minus l over two and plus L over two, all right? And so if I do go ahead and do that evaluation, um, and then I've, I'm gonna get sine of an argument minus sine of negative the argument, which just gives me an extra factor of two. And so what I'm going to get is a, uh, is a two over K, and then a sine 
of KL over 2. Okay. But I don't want to stop there because um, notice that, that what we're looking for is a function of K. And so I've got a K up here and I've got a K down here. And I'll also have a KL over 2. Well, I've got the 2. All it's missing is the L. So I'm going to go ahead and actually put in some Ls. All right. And so let me multiply and divide by L. And the reason for doing that, and you can immediately see why, is I actually now have something that goes as, I'll just go ahead and say A of K, is going as L times, and you now recognize that's the sink. It's the sink function of KL over 2, right? Because I got the KL over 2 here, and it was being divided by KL over 2, and all that was left over was this L. All right. And so what that means is that I've got my solution, uh, and so it is a sink. And that actually shouldn't be a surprise, um, because when we did the Fourier series of a pulse train, square pulse train, we did get sinks, but we got an infinite series of them. Now that this is a Fourier transform, there is no infinite series. Uh, there's only a Fourier transform, and it's a function of k. And so this is now a function in k space, and we drew it before, and it was just a sink. And so let me just draw what that looks like. And so um, what we're going to get is a function of k, all right? And this thing goes to 1. So this is a of k I'm plotting and it goes to 1, and it has these uh, oscillations. It has a central peak, and then it oscillates and decays, right? So it decays away. So it's it's actually a localized function. It, it has a certain range to it, okay? There's a certain range or width to this function in k-space, and there was a certain width to it in direct space or, or x-space, right? So its width here is, is actually L, and then here there's going to be some width, which is going to be some kind of a delta k. In fact, let me just write that as a, uh, as a delta k, right? So there's some, yep, there's some kind of a delta k, which is the width of this function in k space. And then that's to be compared with the width L uh, in direct space. And that's going to lead us to a really important relationship between um, the width of functions in k space versus direct space and vice versa. Okay. Uh, let me go ahead and finish, though. I mean, so we got the Fourier transform, but just to make the whole thing clear, um, I can actually Fourier transform back. And so f of x will be 1 over pi, the integral from 0 to infinity, L times sinc of KL over 2, cosine of Kx. And now this would actually be integrated over dk. Okay. And so then that would get me back to f of x. And so I can just freely go from um, a of k to f of x uh, back and forth um, in this case. All right. Well, what I want to do is, um, is let's uh, look at something similar to that. Um, so it's another example, but it's going to be um, a little bit more detailed. Uh, so what this is going to be. Let me, I should just go ahead and start a new page here. Um, so let, this is going to be a, a, uh, a wave train. Okay, and what I mean by that is, let me just go ahead and make my axes. This is, is direct space. I'm going to have f of x. Uh, but I'm going to have a start point at minus l over 2 and an end point at l over 2. And then... I'm going to have a wave train. So it's just, this is actually going to be sinusoidal. So I'm just going to have a sinusoidal wave train here. Okay. Um, and so what I want to do is define this. And I may not quite have drawn it quite right because I want to define this thing as f of x is equal to, it's going to be, uh, might even be an E field times cosine. And I'm going to go ahead and put K0x on this because this K0, I, I do have not only a, 
a width L, uh, but I've got a but I've got a wavelength here, right? So I've actually got a wavelength little little lambda, right? So it's it's a repeat of the function, um, you know, inside this interval from minus L over two to L over two, right? It's not a repeat of the function itself. So this is not a periodic function, but it happens to go as cosine. And so K zero is just going to be two pi over lambda. That's just the, the standard expression. And then um, it's going to be zero. So it's going to be uh, equal to the cosine when the absolute value of X is less than L over two and it's going to be equal to zero when the absolute value of x is greater than L over two, okay? And so we want to go ahead and, and do this, um, uh, do the Fourier transform of that. The reason I didn't draw this right is because you can actually see I, I just accidentally, when I was scribbling here, uh, drew a sine, okay? Whereas I really want it to be a cosine. Cosine, because that way I know that the B of K will go to zero, right? So um, if, I draw my, uh, if I draw my diagram better, uh, it would be looking like a cosine, and that's what I want. All right. So then, therefore, we only have to go after a of k. And so then I'll pull out my e0. I get the integral from minus l over 2 to l over 2. And then this is cosine of k0x, and then times cosine of kx dx. Okay. Um, this is a, a point of possible confusion. When you're dealing with waves, in fact, as we get into diffraction. Diffraction is a physical process that forms Fourier transforms. And so that's why we're putting a big emphasis on Fourier transforms here is because when light waves diffract off of diffraction gratings or off of apertures, as they propagate into the far field away from the aperture, uh, they form the Fourier transform. So, so diffraction is, is a physical way of doing a Fourier transform. Okay. Um, and so if I have a wave, it has a natural k vector to it, and I'm going to be calling that k0. But when we're doing Fourier transforms, we're taking integrals with respect to this continuous variable uh, k. All right. So don't confuse, don't confuse uh, k0 with k. They're, they're, they're playing very different roles. The k0 actually is relating to the wave properties, whereas the k is relating to the Fourier transform properties. All right, so um, so I now have a integral of, of a product of cosines. And so at this stage, what we can do is, is use a trig identity to turn that into a, um, what actually initially looks like a more complicated integral, but it's going to actually help us understand sort of physically what's going on here. So this is gonna be going from L over two, minus L over two to plus over L over two. Um, the product of cosines is equal to one half, and then I'm going to have cosine of k0 plus k x, and then plus cosine of k0 minus k times x, and then this whole thing is over dx. Um, this is actually kind of nice because you, you actually start to recognize situations that we saw um, just last week and also we saw um, in the second or third week of the semester which was when we were looking at beats uh, and we would have a a center frequency and then we would have some modulation around that center frequency well what's happening here is actually looking a lot like that okay because i've got this k and I've got this k0, and so it's like k0 is playing a role of like a, a center k vector, and then there's um, sort of a deviation of plus k and minus k around that. And that's going to produce a spectrum, and that spectrum will have what's called two sidebands. And if any of you are, are ham radio enthusiasts, uh, you know that single sideband uh, detection, double sideband detection, and things like that are all part of uh, radio technology. And so all this is actually starting to sort of come together. So radio technology, Fourier transforms, diffraction, um, they all share uh, the same underlying mathematics, which is Fourier transforms. Okay. Well, so now that I've got this thing expressed in terms of these, um, these cosines, I can very easily then just take my uh, Fourier transform. I'm going to go ahead and skip just a couple of steps because it's, it's just calculus and just evaluating integrals at their limits and things like that. But I'm going to get uh, E0. And I'm going to pick up a sink 
but it's going to be a shifted sink. So this is shifted to k0 plus k over 2 times l. And there's another sink which is shifted, but it's shifted the other way. And this will be shifted to k0 minus k over 2 times l. Okay, and so I end up with a, a function that has two sinks that are centered at two locations, right? And so one is centered at uh, plus k0, and the other is centered at minus k0. And each one is, 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 is just a sink, right? So here I've got my sink. And then here I've got my sink. Okay, and so what I get are um, are two peaks in k space, and I need to make really clear that this is actually in k space now, right? So that this axis here is k. All right. So k space is a spatial frequency, and what this is telling me is that two spatial frequencies go into making up this this wave train, right? This finite wave train that went from minus l over two to l over two, and so one has a positive k, one has a negative k, so it's like positive frequency, negative frequency, and it doesn't take a lot to to kind of recognize that as soon as I start talking about positive frequencies and negative frequencies, if I'm talking about things like, you know, e to the i k x, and then e to the minus i k x, you know, that's giving me cosines, okay, and that's exactly what this cosine is. This cosine literally is coming from the superposition of a positive frequency centered at k0 and a negative frequency, these are spatial frequencies centered at k0. And so the fact that I've got these two peaks, one at positive frequency and negative frequency, uh, is what gives me that cosine in my original wave train. And so as you get into Fourier transform pairs and Fourier analysis, it becomes very natural to start to think in terms of uh, superposition of you know Euler's formula for positive frequencies, negative frequencies, uh, the fact that uh, exponentials you know e to the ikx plus e to the minus ikx is giving me cosines, and then I can also get sines and things like that. And so, so you start to get really comfortable moving back and forth between you know peaks in Fourier space and groups of peaks that are are then essentially interfering. Um, through the Fourier transform to produce the direct functions in, in real space and things like that. It all, I mean, it may not seem natural today, uh, but it becomes very natural uh, as you continue to work with these things.